friend John Petrie uh, started taking me fishing down at uh, Empire. Uh, we went crabbing out at Bayou View Avenue, crabbing Lake Pontchartrain. Those are the places where I got started. But then after I got my bachelor's and before I went to graduate school, I worked for the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries down here at the Passaloo Wildlife Management Area. Eight days on, six days off, before satellite TV, before cell phones. It was call home once a, once a week on Sundays, call the parents, call the girlfriend. The rest of the time it was 10, 12 hours a day in a boat usually, or, or clean the toilets and sweeping them off the floors. But wrote a few tickets and counted some alligator and deer and measured the water salinity and helped a lot of biologists. And that's where I, I decided I wanted to be a biologist. The base of the food web is the marsh grass, but then the worms eat that, the shrimp eat that, and that's what people catch and sell, yeah. or they're catching and selling rides to go catch the speckled trout who are eating the, the shrimp. So yeah, you know, a little bit of dinky worm, you think who cares, but they're an important part of this system. This was a grad student's thesis, who and she followed through and uh, turned it into a publication. That's exactly what we want to see. You know, we caught a little bit of oil right at the end of Paso Loop by the lighthouse on Sunday, May 2nd. 25th, we went down here, and uh, I'll show you some pictures of the computers. Have, but we planted some black mangrove down there, spring of 2009, and it was already a trip set up to monitor that restoration project, and that was a research project, um, and it had oil on it. And then the biologist took us over here and showed us where the oil had parked for a while. I uh, haven't been to a lot of oil spills. Uh, the few I've seen, the oil that I've seen the oil sits uh, is stickier. This kind of looks like it moved through and kept on going, which I heard the response people tell me was a good thing because that way they can, it makes it easier for them to recover if they can catch it when the tide then takes it off the wetland. So there's about half the uh, black mangrove out there we could see oil uh, on them. This is a uh, roseau cane. Uh, a lot of people like it down here. It makes a great duck blind. Yeah, so it's, it's still kind of healthy up, hot, up top. Uh, you see the oil's down here. You see the uh, yellowing suggesting some toxicity. Notice there's no oil on the water. You don't even see a sheen on the water. Uh, the biologist told me, the, wildlife, you know, with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries told me the oil sat in here for about a week and then blew out. Um, and you know, there's some oil stuck to these stems here. I've never uh, uh, worked with this species uh, with uh, an oil spill. In a greenhouse, so when I took uh, oyster grass, Spartina alternaflora, and totally covered it with South Louisiana crude, all the leaves died and the plant lived. It turned bright green, and uh, the plant, you know, it slowed down, it slowed its growth, but the plant survived. Um, I don't know how this piece is going to do. Hopefully, it'll behave the same way, and, and these individual plants will live. Because of that experience, I'm always more concerned about the soil getting down to the mud, then you're looking at some real problems. Uh, with root depth and uh, uh, plants spreading out as they grow. But uh, that's what I saw Tuesday. It took a month for the oil to get here. So that's a month for the toxic things to evaporate out of it. Usually the toxic things are the smaller molecules. They evaporate, evaporate faster. It's a month for biodegradation to, uh, to occur. So there's less of it. Um, but I keep, I keep looking on those two things. It's south, it's not diesel, it's got a month to weather before it gets ashore, and uh, yeah, I hope it's different from my uh, laboratory experiments. Well, I know it's going to be different from my laboratory experiments. It's going to be diluted and more weathered by the time it gets here. They might be eating old, you know, marsh roots and marsh grass, or they might be eating oil. Well, that bubbling to me says, suggests a lot of uh, microbial activity, and hopefully they're eating all that oil up. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. How much land we lost since you started been working down there? Wetland loss, I don't know about the acres just down there, but I can tell you on average we lose about an acre every 40 minutes, day in and day out. What is this oil going to do if it breaks down the root systems of these plants as far as land loss? <clears throat> well, I, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how... The, this oil spill is going to affect uh, the ongoing wetland loss, but the the, the why it's an important why it is important is the fact that the, this this entire coastal marsh area has to uh, build up an elevation every year to offset the fact that the ground is, that is 
the ground underneath it is subsiding. So the, uh, the, the basement subsiding, sea level's rising, and these marshes have to build up. And they do that primarily through their root system. This organic matter uh, controls this buildup process. And so the, the potential is that some of these areas that are barely building up fast enough to hang on, to you know, staying uh, high enough not to drown, and the fear is that this little stress, even though it's not wouldn't by itself kill it, it'll stress it enough that the vegetation can't keep up. Year after that, it's even more flooded and kind of enters a uh, feedback to just more flooding, more flooding, less production, less production. After a couple decades, uh, the vegetation drowns. That's the fear. I don't know if that's going to happen. But I certainly hope not. Two twenty one. You are two twenty one. You had a special cheese, a crab burger. Two twenty four. Burger special. Cheese. How's that, my man? That'll work. Nobody knows how long it's going to take. Even if they plug the leak for everything to write itself, I mean, I don't think professors know. It could be five years, it could be 50, so I, I feel for the people whose livelihoods it's really affecting. They're hiring at the frost top. <laughs> Hear about it. Talk about it here. Rush Radio 99.5 WRNO. Members of the National Guard across He's the He's just state. attended a lengthy briefing in Louisiana for a first-hand update on response to the Gulf oil spill. The president's first stop, though, was a beach in Port Fouchon. We've got about seven miles of beach here where two types of Boom, the, bird been laid. the president holding quarter-sized tar balls in his hand. BP saying it won't know for two days whether its temporary success with plugging the main part of the leak can last. Uh, the president getting a briefing in Grand Isle the oil spill in efforts to fight it earlier this afternoon. Governor Bobby Jindal, along with the governors of Alabama and Florida, attending, along with Senators Mary Landrieu and David Vitter, Congressman John Malonso, and others. The president of Blackwood's Parish, Billy Dungaster, knows what he wants to hear today. The president has to look. American people and I and say we are doing absolutely everything physically possible to keep the oil out of the marsh. Senator David Vitter wants to see the government speed up the delivery of resources needed in the battle with the oil. There needs to be a much greater sense of urgency and there needs to be a clear a line of authority so this really is run like a flood fight or a war. BP says it won't know until Sunday if the top kill attempt to shut off the flow of oil has worked or not. The company says a disaster in the Gulf has cost BP $930 million so far.